Hey friends, hope you're doing well. Hope you got your coffee. I got mine. I'm out here on the front porch. It's pretty cold, but it's really loud inside the house, so I figured let's talk on the porch. Uh, th I just noticed that this week was the anniversary of Alex Chilton passing away. Alex Chilton uh, died on March 17, 2010. My memories of that were I was at South by Southwest and hanging out with some friends when I heard about it, and that just happened to be the year that Big Star was supposed to get back together and play at South by Southwest. And I'm going to talk about that a little bit here, but I figured I wonder what people were writing about you know, when Alex Chilton passed away. So I looked through a bunch of old newspaper archives and I dug up some pretty good stuff. There's some really great writers out there doing good stuff and uh, I figured I would share a little bit of that. This is from The Independent in London. This is a nice, nice overview. Um, by, this is Pierre Perron. I hope I'm pronouncing his name right. This is really good. It says, Alex Chilton, singer and guitarist with the Power Pop Pioneers Big Star. The Memphis-born singer and guitarist Alex Chilton disproved the theory that there are no second acts in popular music. As a teenager with a raspy voice, he fronted the 1960s blue-eyed soul group The Box Tops and scored worldwide hits with the letter Cry Like a Baby and Soul Deep. In the early 70s, he formed Big Star, who distilled the British invasion sound of the Beatles and the Birds, Jingle Jangle, and invented the power pop genre. I really loved the mid-60s British pop music. All two and a half minutes or three minutes long, really appealing songs. So I've always aspired to that same format. That's what I like, said Chilton, whose gorgeous peant, I'm not sure how to, pr how to pronounce the word, uh, whose gorgeous P-A-E-A-N to September Girls, later covered by the Bangles, was rated by Rolling Stone magazine as one of the top 500 songs of all time. The first incarnation of Big Star only issued two studio albums, uh, Number One Record 1972 and Radio City 1974, but they, came, they became the ultimate cult band and influenced much of what subsequently happened on the alternative scene in the U.S. and around the world. The likes of R.E.M., Teenage Fan Club, Counting Crows, and The Hold Steady in 1987, The Replacements even recorded an homage simply called Alex Chilton, which became a college radio favorite and is now playable on Rock Band 2. I'm going to guess that most of you know that replacement song. There's a lot of Replacements fans out there. Um, and a lot of you know, when they mention R.E.M., but Teenage Fan Club. I don't know how many of my older viewers dig Teenage Fan Club, but man, they're really great really great and um i don't know if you uh it's worth looking up look up sometime today teenage fan club songs from northern england that's a that's a, a great album let's see the um chilton made several solo albums including the wonderfully ragged uh, like flies on sherbert in 1979 and produced the cramps first two singles and their 1980 debut album songs the lord taught us as well as the equally demented Tab Falco's Panther Burns, uh, with whom he toured in the early 80s. Born in 1950, Chilton was the son of his jazz musician and began playing guitar at the age of 13. As a teenager, he loved rhythm and blues, and in particular the music coming out of the Stax label, as much as the Fab Four and other British invasion groups. In 1966, he joined the DeVilles, a five-piece who were soon renamed the Box Tops, and began recording at Chip Moman's American Sound Studio under the guidance of producer Dan Penn. That's some heavyweights right there. They spent most of Saturday doing more than 30 takes of the Wayne Carson Thompson comp composition, The Letter. Penn taught Chilton to say aeroplane and told him to get a little gruff then enhanced the track with the sound of a plane taking off and a strings and horns arrangement by Mike Leach, thus creating one of the most memorable singles of 1967. Leased to Bell Records, the letter topped the American charts and has been covered by dozens of acts, most famously Joe Cocker, who made the U.S. Top 10 with it in 1970. You guys know that song. It's hard to believe that the voice singing 
the letter of 17 years old. Alex Chilton, 17 years old, had that voice. It's beautiful that he was coached by people like Dan Penn and Chips Moman who could bring out all of those wonderful things from his voice. Over the next three years, the box top scored an impressive run of U.S. hits including Neon Rainbow and Soul Deep. Two more Carson compositions as well as Cry Like a Baby, written by Penn and his regular collaborator Spooner Old Oldham, and Choo Choo Train, I Met Her in Church, and Sweet Cream Ladies, Forward March. However, even if the box top played live as a band, Penn and Moman, who took over production duties in 1968, often employed session musicians such as the guitarist Reggie Young and Bobby Womack, with Chilton's amazingly soulful voice the only constant. Reggie Young, man. And Bobby Womack. Reggie Young. Chilton grew increasingly frustrated and effectively ended the box tops when he f left in February 1970. Though Bell milked their catalog for another year, after a spell in New York, during which he turned down the opportunity to replace David Clayton Thomas in Blood, Sweat, and Tears, Chilton returned to Memphis in 1971. He toyed with the idea of forming an acoustic duo with his friend, the guitarist and songwriter Chris Bell. Instead, Bell suggested they recruit Stevens and bassist Andy Hummel to, from his own group, Icewater, and they, bega they became Big Star. It recorded at Arden Studios, number one record included the much-covered melancholy ballad 13, co-written by Chilton and Bell, and received rave reviews. Unfortunately, the expertise of Stax, its distributor, lay in marketing soul music rather than the blueprint for what was yet to be called power pop, and the album had little impact. Bell left and Big Star soldiered on and made the equally wonderful Radio City as a three-piece. When this also sank without a trace, they disbanded. Though the darker album Chilton subsequently recorded with another Memphis legend, producer Jim Dickinson, was credited to Big Star on its much-delayed release as Third Sister Lovers in 1978. Man, all of these names. Like, when I think of there's so much rich music and so much that Memphis has given to American culture even outside of music but man he really was hanging with uh, some of the heavyweights there in Memphis the people who forged what American music would be sounding like in the years to come and he was right there taking part in it by then, Chilton had headed back to New York and fallen in with the punk crowd at CBGB's. He also became addicted to heroin, though he managed to keep touring and recording and eventually kicked the drug. In the 1980s, he moved to New Orleans, where he took a succession of odd jobs before resuming his career in music. In 1987, he played guitar on Can't Hardly Wait, one of the singles from the Replacements album, Pleased to Meet Me which also contained the irresistible Alex Chilton. Two years later, he participated in the first of several Box Tops reunions, though he always spent more time on Big Star and his solo projects. In 2000, Cheap Trick, another group inspired by Big Star, recorded the Chilton Bell song, In the Street, for the sitcom That 70s Show. I've been performing in the public eye since I was 16, Chilton said. I got lucky and had a number one hit that summer. So my mom and dad were like, why don't you go ahead and give this rock thing a try? Good job, mom and dad. That's good parenting. Why don't you go ahead and give this rock and roll thing a try? I guess that my life has been a series of flukes in the record business. The first thing I ever did was the biggest record that I'll ever have. I've been paid... I've been paid for some things that were real successful for no good reason, and I've not been paid for things that weren't so successful for a lot of good reasons. You can't live your life being upset about things. Chilton died of a suspected heart attack three days ago before Big Star were due to play at the South by Southwest Conference in Austin, Texas. I have to believe that a lot of you are Big Star fans and Alex Chilton fans. I know that a lot of you, this might be the first time you've heard of them, but... Um, it's one of those secret handshakes in music. With the internet, nothing is really secret anymore, and that's a good thing. But there were certain people that you would, 
you'd meet someone and they'd start talking about what records they like. And if a person said they were an Alex Chilton fan or a Big Star fan, I don't know. You just like that person. At least I can think of so many people I've met that that would be one of the cues of it. Oh, okay, that's what you're into. And I, it just opens up this, you realize that they went a little bit deep with music and there was, I don't know, open and they knew about some things. So I have a lot of friends that I've met when we first talked about music, they would bring up Big Star or Alex Chilton. It's kind of like in 1995 when somebody would mention Towns Van Zandt, you know, or Blaze Foley. It's just a lot of people like that that people mention and um, you realize, okay, I know who you are. At least I have some little, little piece of an idea. This is from the obituary section of the Boston Globe, and uh, it's written by Chris Tao, but I'm going to skip through and read a couple quotes that, from people in here. He talks about how um, Chilton went through the box tops thing and all of that. They said, but Mr. Chilton soon realized he did not enjoy playing it straight, said Chip Smolman, then his producer. This is Chip Smolman here. He wanted to do his own thing, Moman said in an interview yesterday. He didn't want to do those kinds of songs we were doing. Sometimes that's more powerful than the money you receive for a hit record. And we go on, and this is Paul Westerberg talking about Alex Chilton. In my opinion, Alex was the most talented triple threat musician out of Memphis, and that's saying a ton. His versatility at soulful singing, pop rock songwriting, master of the folk idiom, and his delving into the avant-garde goes without equal. He was also a hell of a guitar player, and he was a great guy. That was Paul Westerberg from The Replacements. Uh, and here's a, another quote. Mr. Chilton said in a 1987 interview that he did not mind flying under the radar with Big Star and as a solo artist. What would be ideal, this is Alex Chilton talking, what would be ideal would be to make a ton of money and have nobody know about you. He said, fame has a lot of baggage to carry around. I wouldn't want to be like Bruce Springsteen. I don't need that much money and wouldn't want to have 20 bodyguards following me. That is a wise man. Well, that would be, you don't need a lot, you don't need the fame. You need the, a little bit of the money to get by. I'll skip down a little bit. Um, there was this feeling of yearning, said Lou Barlow, a member of the band's Dinosaur Jr. and Sabado. The songs were beautiful and the melodies were just almost like intuitive. Barlow said he was unexpectedly blindsided by emotions when he heard Mr. Chilton's death. People had no idea how much emotion would hit them, he said in a phone interview from Austin. It was like a tidal wave. Barlow said the emotional honesty of Mr. Chilton's songs attracted a wide range of fans in the music world. Covers by bands as diverse as Sunshine Popsters, The Bangles, September Girls, and the alt-country outfit Sunvolt shows the breadth of his influence. Barlow's favorite was a rendition of 13 by the late Elliot Smith, whose musical style leaned heavy on Big Star. There were just these moments in Alex Chilton's songs that were so beautiful and so lonely, a real authentic feeling that sometimes when other people have in their songs feel self-indulgent or not real, Barlow said. But when Alex Chilton did it, it was like, whoa, this is so real. And, uh, like I said, that's Lou Barlow from Dinosaur Jr. One thing that's fun about digging through some of these uh, old newspaper archives is I see names that I know pop up and uh, Bob Mayer. Um, when I was looking through Memphis newspapers, I found a lot of stuff that Bob Mayer wrote about. And you might know Bob Mayer. He wrote the Replacements book, The Trouble Boys. Great, great book. I had him on my podcast back when. Bob's a really cool and great guy. And um, I run into him every now and then. He's a really, really good guy. And he's a great, great writer. I think he just won um, a Grammy for the Wilco liner notes, I think. He won a... He won a major award for something, and it's much deserved. He does really, really great work. I have so much respect and love for Memphis, mainly because it's not, like when I go to Memphis, it feels so working class, even though its cultural output is huge. You don't feel that in a lot of places that, uh, you know, have 
world fame for music, you know, or the arts. But Memphis just, you can see it in the architecture, in the neighborhoods, the people. It feels like there's, there's nothing, it doesn't feel like somebody walking on a red carpet, you know, and uh, it feels like people getting down to work and making things, making art. And uh, I love that about Memphis. It's really hard to put into words. Even when you're just walking down a neighborhood, I went to see Aretha Franklin's house that she was raised in, and uh, that neighborhood, man, just everything about it feels so gritty and real, and you don't feel that. And it's not the it city. You know, you drive three hours over to Nashville. I love Nashville, but it's a whole different thing. It's a whole different thing. And um, I don't know, to be respected in a place like Memphis and loved in a place like Memphis, that's huge. It's really huge, and, uh, and it's beautiful to see someone as talented as Bob Mayer, who's part of the soil there, respecting and uh, paying tribute to somebody, to Alex Chilton, somebody who is the soil there. So Bob Mayer wrote some beautiful articles right upon his death, and then a few days later kept following up with stuff. And uh, this is a big send-off for the music man. Memorial for Alex Chilton Draws Friends and Family by Bob Mayer. This is in the Memphis Commercial Appeal. During his life, Alex Chilton made music of deep soulfulness, ornate beauty, and glorious chaos. It was perhaps a more muted but still thoughtful feeling that permeated Midtown's Minglewood Hall on Tuesday evening as Chilton's family, friends, and fans gathered to celebrate the late Memphis music legend. Chilton, the supreme rock and roll iconoclast, who made his name with the box tops, a uh, big star and as a solo artist, died in his adopted home of New Orleans on March 17th from an apparent heart attack. He was cremated during a private ceremony in New Orleans last week. If a man is measured by the company he keeps, then Chilton clearly lived a rich, full, and varied life. Many of those in attendance had come from all over the globe, Australia and Austin, Texas. and. Uh, and the mourners represented seemingly every strata of society, from old Memphis gentry to local punk rock royalty, and all points in between. As old friends greeted one another for the first time in decades, a big screen flashed a slideshow. Snapshots of Chilton on the beach, on stage, bopping comically into a Catholic school bus. These pictures were offset by a barrage of other random images of Chilton favorites from the sublime to ridiculous, a picture of bluesman Furry Lewis's headstone, a courtroom photo of Phil Spector's wild Afro toupee, a sepia tone image of Gene Autry cradling a guitar. A small, formal, a small formal program came at the gathering's midpoint with Chilton's longtime bassist, Ron Easley, who helped organize the event along with Chilton's sister, Cecilia and wife, Laura, introducing Rep Representative Steve Cohen. Cohen had honored Chilton on the floor of Congress shortly after his death, remembered Alex Chilton as a special person who, who encompassed Memphis music in a different way. Easily brought a contingent of musicians and producers on stage who presented the many phases of Chilton's career, from members of the box stops and Big Star to old Memphis comrades like Sid Selvage and New Orleans foals like Doug Garrison. Chilton's wife, Laura, joined Easley on stage with flute in hand to play a classical memorial for her late husband. As the mourners slowly began exiting, many stopped by a display in the corner of the hall, festooned with stories and remembrances of, of Chilton. Some of these Alex tales were handwritten on the spot. Others typed and spent in Others typed and sent in from far off locales. A few ran several pages while others just a handful of times. Pinned at the bottom of the board was a blue note card that bore a simple and perfect epitaph for Chilton. One of a kind. That's Bob Mayer in the Memphis commercial appeal. So the last thing I'd like to share with you guys is while I was digging through this stuff, like I said, it's fun to see what names pop up that you might know and um, I saw in the LA Times a piece written by Ann Powers. Now, I've never met Ann that I know of, I don't think, but um, we have a lot of mutual friends. She lives in my East Nashville neighborhood there in Nashville. And um, 
I uh, she's just a great writer, and you've probably heard her doing stuff on NPR, and uh, just really, really, this piece here is just written beautifully. I think it was more personal, and I'll share a little bit of that with you guys just to give you an idea. But it says, uh, Musician's Death Leaves Void at Austin Festival by Ann Powers. I was supposed to go out and hear some music. I'm at South by Southwest in Austin, Texas, the biggest, wildest annual gathering of melodic music makers this nation knows. Instead, I'm sitting in my hotel room writing this eulogy for Alex Chilton, the Memphis, Tennessee-rooted musician who died of an apparent heart attack Wednesday at 59 in New Orleans, 59 years old. Chilton was supposed to play here Saturday with his band, Big Star. It was the one show on my schedule that I was unequivocally excited to see. Instead, he's gone, leaving South by Southwest and rock and roll punched through like a cheap paper bag. That paper bag analogy has a specific reference point. Big Star, which Chilton formed in 1970 with the late Chris Bell, Andy Hummel, and Jody Stevens, was named after a Memphis supermarket chain. That group's indignantly loud and gorgeous power pop inspired more young rockers than did any other fairly obscure rock save that of the Velvet Underground. Somewhere in a trunk, I have a tattered souvenir from a Big Star store in Memphis, picked up on a pilgrimage to the South I'd made when I was 21, when I set forth to find some mineral traces of the blues and early rock heritage I'd only read about in books. What I found on that journey was Alex Chilton. I'd already come to love Big Star's catalog, in introduced me via the mixtapes my friends and I made as we built our own twisted history of music. Alex Chilton was a wandering her heretical patriarch of our new religion. I'll skip down just a little bit here. but We shook our messy hair to Big Star's strutting rockers like In the Street, the band's best-known song thanks to Cheap Trick's version for that 70s show, and September Girls, party anthems that were like Led Zeppelin hits for the kids who got beaten up by real Zeppelin fans. That is a great, great line. And we slow danced to Chilton's ballads, especially those for, from Big Star's third album, Sister Lovers, made after the band had basically fallen apart. That record remains one of the most lucid expressions of youthful sorrow in the annals of guitar pop. Chilton was a music industry veteran by the time he made Sister's Lovers, with the help of a bunch of Memphis characters. He'd been a teen, one-hit wonder fronting the box tops who sung the letter featured a Tom Jones-style vocal that Chilton quickly abandoned for something more cracked and crazier. Big Star had not made it big. Sister Lovers tells the story of Chilton's unraveling. Its songs are beautiful, but not sentimental. Its songs are beautiful, but never sentimental. Sorry about that. They made me love this mess of a guy. Then I saw him live. By that time, Chilton had explored raw noise with the performance art damaged combo Tav Falco and the Panther Burns and helped the Cramps, whose debut album he produced, turn rockabilly into horrorcore. He'd seen and done enough to be cynical, and he projected that attitude. Yet in the midst of music making, he became something remarkable, a living repository of that unheard music, a profane, profound, wisecracking American music man. Again, that's Ann Powers in the New York Times. I'm sorry, in the Los Angeles Times. All apologies there. Just absolutely beautiful. Absolutely beautiful. I I am freezing out here and uh, I want to go inside. I have more stuff that I would share, but I think that's plenty. Tell me what's your favorite Alex Chilton stuff? What's your favorite song? You know, what's your go-to? And um, I don't know, turn some people on in the comments. There's a lot of people watching this that don't really, have never heard before, and the rest of you are going to lead them to the good stuff, and hopefully I can help that out. But I will see you guys down the road. Oh, I should also say, we've been doing this Saturday morning thing for 99 weeks in a row now. This is the number 99. Next Monday, or I mean next Saturday, I'm really cold, so my mouth's not working real well. Next um, Saturday, it will be 100. 
I'm going to like answer some questions. If you guys want to ask me some questions down below, help me out and um, make them good. I may not have good answers for them, so I may not answer. It won't mean your questions suck. It means my answers suck. I want to entertain you guys and inform you all and all that good stuff. But be 100 in a row. I've made over 500 videos and put them on this channel in like the last little over two years. And um, they're over 400 of them are public and I've privated some of them uh, for whatever reasons. But uh, I've been busy and I look forward to staying busy. But next week is 100. So let's do this all together. When you see that pop up next week, click on it and we'll have a good time together. Until then, I'll see you down the road. Much love to you.